I recently did a couple videos about stupid things that Protestants and Catholics say to each other, and there was one particular point that I made that caught a lot of attention in the comments, which was the idea that Catholics pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to the saints, and as the accusation goes, this is a form of idolatry or divination or some other such thing. And while I made a few quick points in that video, given the amount of attention that got, I figured I should give this topic a little more time and nuance, so that's why I'm making this video. To set the stage, I'm going to repeat one of the things that I said in that last video, which is that Catholics do not worship the saints, but we do pray to them. And while worship always includes prayer, not all prayer is a form of worship. In the same way, all singing involves the use of your voice, but not all use of your voice is a form of singing. Prayer just means communication, and etymologically, and in older forms of English, people would use it in a colloquial way all the time. They might say something like, pray thee over there, can you fix my horse's horseshoe, or whatever it's called. Um, as Catholics, we communicate with the saints and we seek their intercession. Now, even if that's not worship, it's still bad enough in the eyes of many Protestants, at least from what they've told me, because that is seen as looking for an intermediary or a mediator other than Jesus, or it's simply communicating with the dead, both of which are forbidden in scripture. 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity. Notice that it says humanity as a plural body, not God and you, but God and humanity. Anyways, um, and then it says, and that's Jesus. Jesus is that mediator. So what are we crazy Catholics doing trying to get to God by going to those who have passed on into the afterlife as if we're trying to sidestep going through Jesus? The first thing we need to do to set this topic in its proper context is to be attentive to the fact that the Christian faith is not an individualistic piety. It's not about just you and God. That verse I just quoted from said God and humanity, humanity being a plural body of people, obviously. Our calling to be disciples of Jesus is paired consistently and directly with our calling to love our neighbors as ourselves and to live in community with one, one another as members of Christ's body. When Jesus is asked to summarize the entirety of his moral teaching and the entirety of the law, he says that we are to love God with all of our strength and all of our heart and that the second thing, which is like the first, is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus' preaching devoted a considerable amount of attention to how we treat one another and often tied it back to our salvation. To be a follower of Jesus means to participate in the life of his church, which scripture speaks consistently very highly of, in spite of the way that a lot of Protestants I've heard tend to denigrate for some strange reason. The Bible says that the church is Christ's body of which he is the head. To condemn and throw stones at the church means you're throwing them at Christ's body. At another point, it calls it his bride, his beloved bride. And in another, it calls it the pillar and foundation of truth. And it's easy to understand why this emphasis exists. Being in community gives us lots of opportunity to learn to love others the way that God loves us so that we can become more like him in practice. If we can't learn to show love towards the people who are right in front of us, how can we say that we love God who isn't right in front of our face? And one of the ways that we love each other is by encouraging each other's piety and praying for one another. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another. Jesus says that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, that he will be there among them. In other words, the efficacy of a prayer that is combined in multiple hearts and minds is much more likely to get his attention. So it's obviously important to Jesus and to the Bible that we pray as a community, as a body, and that we do so for one another. But hang on. Does this mean that we're trying to go around Jesus as our sole mediator? When I ask my friends who are Christians to pray for me, does that mean I'm introducing another mediator besides and in competition with Christ? Of course not. Why? Because those are members of his body, and that body leads to the head, 
which is Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we as the church are ambassadors of Christ. We represent him and his incarnation to the world and to each other for every generation. Turning to each other for spiritual support isn't a kind of circumvention of his mediation. We're not going to a different channel. We're going up the chain of command, which eventually leads to him. There's nothing incompatible about asking for that kind of support from other Christians who are part of his body. And that's the exact same thing we do when we pray to the saints in heaven with one difference, which is that they're in heaven and that much closer to Christ as members of his body. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're not supposed to pray to the dead according to the Bible. Well, that's the thing. Those who died in Christ aren't dead. They are alive in his kingdom. Even the patriarchs prior to his death and resurrection, according to him, wouldn't qualify as being dead according to that language. I was discussing this with a Protestant who was criticizing Catholics for this reason, saying we commune with the dead. And so I asked him, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dead? What about Moses and Elijah? Are they dead? And he said, yes, dead as a doornail. And at that point, I quoted Mark 12, 26 to 27 to him where it says, but concerning the dead rising, have you not read about the burning bush in the book of Moses? How God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are are badly mistaken. So God refers to himself as a God of the living in reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And about Moses and Elijah, well, they both appeared to Jesus in the transfiguration. Jesus communicated with those who have passed on. So there can't be an absolute blanket prohibition on communicating with the dead as if that's a sin, because if it is, then it's a sin that Jesus himself committed. So obviously there's a form of communication with those who have passed on that is not only permissible, but good. But then the question becomes, how do we know which is which? The distinction is by praying only to those who remain alive in God's kingdom, those who are in heaven. But again, that raises another question, which is how do we know who's in heaven? Well, the early church had a pretty simple and easy to understand formula for this. Anyone who had been martyred for their faith. Revelation 6, 9 to 11 depicts the martyrs in heaven crying out for justice. But of course, they aren't the only ones. So to know who else is in heaven that we might be able to communicate with and ask for intercession, we turn to the church's judgment. Why? Because Jesus told us that the church has his authority, his divine authority. In Matthew 16, 18 to 19, Jesus gave the apostles and especially specifically Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven that they could bind and loose on earth and in heaven. And I don't know why people gloss over this verse like it's insignificant. Think about this, the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the authority to compromise heaven itself by their teaching, his kingdom, their keys. They have the power and authority to unlock his kingdom. I've never heard Pastor Rick down at the local Baptist church talk about his anointing in this way, only the Catholic Church talks about apostolic and papal authority like this. He also gave them the authority to forgive sins in John 20, 23, which everyone hearing this knew that that was God's authority alone. And in Matthew 18, 17, Jesus assigns the church to be the final court of appeal in disputes among brothers. He didn't say, when you can't agree on something, just pick up your Bibles and start quoting verses at each other until one of you gives up. He said, tell it to the church. And if your brother still won't listen to you at that, at that point, then he's anathema, he's excommunicated. So by that authority that the church has been given, the church makes inquiry about those souls who have lived admirable and holy and venerable lives to see if they are in fact beatified in the presence of God in the afterlife. And one way that they test this is by checking to see if there are any miracles that have taken place by those who have asked for their intercession. Which by the way, demons can't do that. Demons can't restore health because they can't create life out of nothing. They can't create life where there is death. And there are countless documented cases of witness miracles 
through the intercession of saints, including in our modern times. And I'm not talking about people who fell on the floor because some televangelist blew a kiss at them or something like that. I'm talking about people who were under supervised professional medical care and who were dramatically, suddenly, and inexplicably healed to the bewilderment and often the conversion of their medical caregivers. And I could spend an entire video documenting examples of this for you, but I'll just address two of them. I'll highlight two of them for you uh, that emerged from the canonization process of John Paul, Pope John Paul II, who is now a saint. These are the miracles that confirm that he is a saint capable of interceding on our behalf. The first miracle involved a French nun named Sister Marie Pierre, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which is the same disease that afflicted John Paul II up until his death. Um, and Parkinson's is incurable, by the way. So after her diagnosis, her symptoms continued to progress quite severely until it got to the point where she struggled to walk and write and her left arm was so disabled that it just hung at her side. On the day that she decided to pray to the deceased Pope John Paul II, she said that she had become totally, completely disabled and would have to resign from her post uh, as part of her service to the church. But the very next day after she prayed, she woke up completely cured. And medical professionals agreed that her healing was scientifically inexplicable, if not impossible. And you can look her up and see videos of her giving interviews after the fact where there are no signs of the disease. The second miracle involved a woman named Lori Beth Mora Diaz, who suffered a severe brain aneurysm, which Doctors tried to treat by first scanning and then operating on, but then once they had gotten in there, realized it's inoperable and irreparable. Um, and it's also terminal. They told her that she had one month to live after that. After that, she was confined to bed and she was able to watch the beatification ceremony of Pope John Paul II. And at that point, she decided she was going to ask for his intercession. When she fell asleep later, she was awakened by his voice saying, get up don't be afraid. She got out of bed for the first time in a long time since her diagnosis and told her family that she felt completely fine. Her medical caregivers went and did another scan, at which point they couldn't find the aneurysm and had completely disappeared, which left her doctors and her neurologists utterly mystified. They later testified that her instantaneous cure was also scientifically inexplicable. Every modern saint goes through this kind of scrutiny, which leads me to a question and a challenge I want to offer to you. Do you truly think that God would provide these kinds of miracles and these kinds of healings, which only he can do for those participating in divination and superstition? I challenge you to really think about that and to go through the list of the many people who ha have recently been canonized in modern times to hear about all the stories and the miracles that are related to them. Okay, so even if all of that's true, do we really need to create statues and icons and bow down to them and even kiss them? Surely that's idolatry or grave imagery. Well, not all imagery, even religious imagery, is grave imagery according to the Ten Commandments. And we know this. We know this because immediately after giving them the covenant, God commanded them and instructed them in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. He said that it needs to be designed with angels with golden wings reaching out to each other on the top of the lid. The point of that commandment is that we are not to worship or venerate other gods. But in the case of saints, we're not doing that. We're venerating those who are profoundly members of Christ's body. We aren't venerating statues and pictures any more than if I were to kiss a picture of my wife and children, I would be doing so because I want to show affection for the paper that it's printed on. Instead, I'm showing affection for what the image represents. And if there are saints in heaven, which there is ample documented, even scientifically scrutinized evidence that there is, then it stands to reason that we can honor them with our affection through images of them, considering that those images represent Christ's body and his communion of saints. Lastly, this was a well-established practice of the church from the very earliest days, which the church fathers attest to. I'm not going to go through and quote every single one of them, but I will leave a link into the description that will detail a bunch of them for you. Hey, thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you are able to support the work I'm doing, there are a couple of ways you can do that. By donating through my website or by joining my online community, The Reinforcements. Both can be done by visiting brianholdsworth.ca. The .ca because that's how we internet in Canada. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.